Most importantly, is everyone fed, watered, ready to give blood the moment we're done? We have a special offer with the blood mobile tonight. You will be able to corner me for the length of time it takes me to give blood. So, if you have questions for me when we're done, I'll be in the blood mobile. So, how's that for a deal? All right, so we all know no foot, no horse, right? Everybody's heard it. And we all know it is so the truth. So tonight we're going to talk a little bit about why it's the truth and uh, about some of the design flaws that are inherent in equines. We all know there's a few, but the hoof is one of the biggest ones. So without further ado, let's get going on the fabulous equine hoof. First, we're going to start out with some basic anatomy. Yes, your horse is flicking you off at all times. So... Uh, this is the human hand, and this is the equine foot. So your horse's leg from the knee down is from here down in you. So they've taken all of that space from here to here and turned it into a lower leg and a hoof. So we have this right here is here. That's your horse's cannon bone. We've got the first bone in your finger right here, second bone, third bone. So your horse is walking around on a teeny tiny little fingerprint. So he weighs 
conservatively 1200 at least that's what I tell myself Ernie weighs he's probably more around 14 <laughs> but uh, he's walking around on a teeny tiny finger like who thought that was a good idea well it turns out that's a really good idea <laughs> if your job is to eat grass and run away from predators it lets you get away from very fast predators very quickly and it lets you conserve energy the equine leg is designed to conserve the energy of the trot with minimal expenditure of muscle so when a horse hits the ground at a trot all of that concussion is stored in the tendons and ligaments and that's part of what this design is for is to store all that and that's why horses can a at a gallop run away from predators really quick and b at a trot go 100 miles in north carolina um, during the World Equestrian Games, more or less. Um, <laughs> um, but that's, so horses are sort of the best of both worlds when it comes to that part of the design. The problem is we then take them out of their natural environment and we don't cull the ones that don't have very good feet. Uh, we breed them for all kinds of different things. But inherently the design was good for what it was. We've, we've managed to mess it up a little bit, but. This is how that fingernail on the bottom of your horse's foot, called his hoof, is attached. And this is called the lamina, all of this red feathery stuff. And the way it works is a lot like Velcro. And that's what it looks like in close up. So it's, it's kind of Velcro with Velcro inside the Velcro. So there's lots of Velcro. The problem with that is that that requires glucose, just like your brain does, and it requires a lot of it. It's where we get some of the problems we're gonna talk about later. But the foot requires a constant energy supply and it requires a constant blood supply at incredible levels to keep doing what it does. If you, you think about your fingernails growing and the process that's involved in that and then you're gonna walk on that and it's gonna carry all 1,200 of your pounds, that's an incredibly metabolically active thing to do. And so it sets up the hoof for disaster to ensue. Again, that's part two. So let's talk a little bit about the mechanics of all of this and how it all works together. So coming down on that fingertip is your horse's weight. And this arrow is actually where that weight should be coming down in a perfectly designed system. I guess you talk about perfectly designed, and then Dr. Ferguson is going to talk about when the design goes wrong. But that weight is designed to come down right in the center of the foot. That allows the navicular bone right here, the digital cushion, the deep digital flexor, and the lamina to do all of the things that they need to do to hold that foot into place. So you normally have the deep digital flexor tendon pulling up, and you have the lamina, that, that Velcro, pulling all the way around and on the bottom. So that horse is walking on that lamina as well. So all of these forces have to perfectly counteract that force, and it all has to be well designed. We're gonna talk a little bit, I'm gonna do a little tiny bit of what goes wrong. So when that weight moves back on the foot, so this would be a horse who has too long of a toe. Now all of a sudden, we're not gonna have as much tendon pull. We're gonna have a lot more laminar pull, okay? Because see, we've moved that arrow. We've taken it back here. So this distance is smaller, but this distance is larger. And if you go back to basic leverage, I think that was in high school, I don't really remember anymore, but if you go back to basic leverage, the longer your lever arm is, the more pressure you apply. So that's the same thing that happens in a horse with a long toe, and it's why we get super aggressive about long toes. The opposite happens in what we call a club foot. So this is gonna be a horse who's standing up on his tippy toes. Now I don't walk in high heels a lot, but when I do, when I have that one time, my toes really hurt. <laughs> and the same thing happens to your horse because all of a sudden that tendon is pulling a lot more because that lever arm is longer and it's driving the bone into the ground. 
And the lamina doesn't have as much, it, it can't influence things as much because again, its lever arm is this tiny. So it's all about bringing everything up and putting all that weight on the bone. So what does all that mean? It's where we get the design for a well-trimmed and shod foot, which is most of what I get to talk about. And we have a couple of farriers here in the back, so when things are done, you guys can talk to a few of the farriers about how they look at some of these issues. But all of those mechanics that we just talked about, having the weight fall where it needs to be, having the tendon pull enough, and having the lamina pull enough, that's all of what we're going for is all of those mechanics being perfectly balanced in the horse's foot. You're going to notice a little bit of a theme as I go through this, just so you know. So we're going to look at how do we get the weight to fall in the right place. One of the ways we do that is that we make sure that the heel comes back to at least the middle of the fetlock joint above it, and that's this heel here. When the foot is not trimmed correctly, you can see that heel move way far back, and you can see rarely in club-footed horses you'll see it move forward. But much more common as a horse's toe goes forward, the foot says, oh, I'm going to try to compensate for that lever arm being longer here, so it's going to move everything back. So you drop a line straight down from the middle of the fetlock, and it should about hit the heel. On the front side, this is the easy one. There should be a line that comes basically down the front of the pasture and down the front of the hoof. Now, this is where x-rays are going to be important. We'll get to that in a moment. Next, we're going to pick up the foot. The first one was a little bit of confirmation and a little bit of shoeing. This one is a whole lot of trimming and shoeing. This is where the trim comes in, and the trim is the most important part. So we're going to look at your horse's foot and say, where is the widest part of the horse's foot? Now, one of the things I want you to notice about the foot that I use here, this half of the foot is not trimmed, the top half is, which I thought was pretty impressive that we managed to trim half a foot. <laughs> so there's half a trimmed, half a not trimmed. So we're going to find the widest part of the foot. All right, so we pick up the foot, we look at it, we say, all right, there's the wide part. Next, we put a line at the widest part of the heel. That should line up with the widest part of the frog. That should all line up together. And then at the toe, we're going to draw a line. You can see where this horse wasn't trimmed, so we brought his toe back this much, right? This should be even. Now go home and pick up your horse's feet. I can pick up Ernie's foot and tell you it's not even. That's because Ernie's got horrible conformation. So. That's where a shoe has to fix what God didn't give her, and that's a heel. Huh, look at that. We're going to draw a line down the front of the horse's foot, and we should have 50% on the outside and 50% on the inside. It usually ends up being more around 52, 48, and uh, that's because, actually, sorry, the other way around, because horses land on the inside, and where they land, they push foot the opposite way. But again, that's where a good quality trim, and if you can't fix it with a trim, that's where you go to a shoe. So that's where a good farrier is never going to tell you every horse needs shoes. If your horse doesn't need shoes, they don't want to put them on. They're putting shoes on to fix a problem that's there, or because we're showing our horses on you know, hard ground or concrete, you know, things like that, they're wearing their foot down faster. But more often than not, it's because we don't breed horses for really good feet. We breed horses for a lot of other things. Look at that, 50%. So we're going to pick up the bottom of the foot, and we want the same thing. We want 50% on the outside, 50% on the inside. And again, these are all things that your farrier is going to look for when they trim the foot, and they have it where they want, and then they're going to say, all right, what do I need to address from a shoeing standpoint so that I can do, build the best product for this horse's foot? And then we look at the balance. And the way that you look at balance on a foot, one of the things I want you to notice is there are no fingers in this picture. No, no, thing, no human fingers. Do you see that? No human fingers. Because what you don't want to do is pick up the foot, put it between your legs, take your thumbs, and go right like that on the heel bulbs. So lots of times you'll see people take their thumbs right here and go, and you can change the way that balance looks. So you just want to pick up the foot at the fetlock, let it hang, and when you draw a line, 
straight down the bottom of that foot. You want it to be perpendicular with a line across the bottom. So just to prove that all of mine have problems. Uh, so Vespa, my other horse that I, I regularly show, she's a little bit pigeon-toed. So when you do this on her, you know, she wants to, to grow a little too much on the inside. So you got to pay attention to that on her, that when she's trimmed, you pick up that foot and you make sure you got her back to flat because she wasn't put on that way. So you gotta, you got to adjust her. So sometimes the farrier is trimming and they think things are going the way they want them to go and the foot is not responding appropriately. And that's where we come in and shoot radiographs. And it always amazes me what we find on a radiograph. And I, I think that all farriers should come with x-ray vision, but they don't. So since they don't come with x-ray vision, they should come with a veterinarian who can come shoot x-rays for them. So on this foot, we have what we call a negative palmar angle, where the bottom of the hoof tilts down like this. But if you saw this hoof in real life, it looks perfectly normal, and you would never guess that that was there. So for example, on our examples that we were talking about on this hoof, this is one where a farrier would be trimming it, and they're feeling like they're getting a good trim. And every time they come, those heels are squishing down, and they can't quite get them where they want to be, and that toe is scooting out in front of them. And they're, you know, they feel like they're doing as good a job as they can, and the foot's not responding the way it should. And that's where radiographs become a huge help to farriers to say what's going on in there and why is what I'm doing not working. So when we shoot these radiographs for these guys back here, they're going to say, oh, I see. Now I need to do some things with the shoe that will help support what the bones are doing on the inside because the outside is lying to me. Because it sometimes does. And that's why we come with x-rays. So... That's a little bit of the basics of how a foot works. And now, we're going to move on to the fabulous equine hoof. And just a few of the ways it can go wrong, because you guys can't be here for the rest of the week, and the weekend, and all of next month, and through Christmas, and New Year's, and, you know, there we go. So here you go, Dr. Bergeson. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. Yes, and I might have gotten a little carried away because there's so many things to talk about, uh, problems that can go wrong with the hoof. So hopefully I don't keep you here all night. But um, I think I tried to pick the most relevant things that you're most likely to see. All right, so what can go wrong? Um, the most common things that we see are probably in this order, hoof abscesses, laminitis, white line disease, thrush, mushy foot, which is something we've kind of made up here in Florida, and hoof cracks. Um, and there can often be more than one issue. So in the picture up here, this uh, horse obviously has signs of chronic laminitis, but then you can see this lovely pus coming out here that indicates it had an abscess. Um, but they're all interrelated. Laminitis can lead to abscesses, hoof cracks can lead to white line, laminitis can lead to white line, and mushy foot can lead to abscesses. So basically, if you've got one problem, chances are you're going to see more down the road. So we'll start with the most common foot emergency that we get called for. And usually the call is, I think my horse broke his leg. <laughs> um, and as soon as we see that, we all know to um, hurry out there, but we're pretty sure we're going out for a hoof abscess. Um, they are so lame and so painful. This horse in the picture is doing what we call pointing. So he's sticking that foot out, that left front foot out in front of him and saying, this hurts, that's where it hurts, please fix it. Uh, so very obvious lameness at the walk. These horses are also often found down because they just can't bear weight on their feet anymore, they're so sore. And then the other leg is sore because they've been standing on it all day, so the smart ones will lie down. Um, swelling is another thing that throws off a lot of owners. So these horses can be swollen up to the cannon bone in the front, or up to the carpus, the knee in the front, or up to the hock in the back. Um, and it looks like they have a bowed tendon or something horrible going on in, in the cannon bone area, but it's not. It's all just swelling that's backed up from the hoof. Um, increased digital pulses. So um, there are two places you can feel for digital pulses. If you don't know how, ask one of us the next time we're out to look at your horses but you can feel them on the back of the fetlock or right on the back of the pastern. Um, 
but they'll be increased in the foot that has the hoof abscess going on. And that's also a sign we can look for in laminitis. Basically, any sign of inflammation or pain in the foot is going to lead to increased digital pulses. Um, so lots of times, you know, I'll, be, I'll get asked, well, can't you just take an x-ray and see the abscess? Maybe. Um, there are different types of abscesses. They can be filled with different things. They can be filled with pus, like that nice, lovely, thick gray stuff that we saw. They can be filled with serum. They can be filled with some blood, um, like this one in the picture. Um, or they can just be filled with air. We can see the ones that are filled with air, where it's just a, a pocket. Those will show up great on x-rays. But the ones that are filled with pus or soft tissue material, it just blends in with the rest of the foot. So it is not always to see, easy to see an abscess on x-rays. Um, luckily, they're pretty easy to treat. If you wait long enough, they will rupture somewhere. Um, most often, they'll rupture here at the coronet band on the top, but they'll also often uh, rupture out the bottom of the sole. In our experience, they resolve a little faster when they rupture out the sole, because that's where they started. So if you can get that accomplished, you're pretty much done. If you have your vet out, you suspect an abscess, we hoof test it, we find the spot, and then we are able to rupture it right at the sole, then you're probably done. A couple more days, your horse will be looking miraculously better. If you wait longer, it will eventually travel all the way up from the bottom to the top of the foot and rupture out here. Um, do you, does anybody know what is in the top picture there? That's a grown out hoof abscess. So it popped out at the coronet band and then the hoof grew down, looks like for about three or four months. And uh, it, there's that little defect in the hoof. That's just a grown out hoof abscess. Um, Sometimes we'll see those and, and we'll say, oh, did you notice your horse was lame? And the owner will say, no, it was, it was fine. I never noticed any lameness. So sometimes they can pop out and you don't even notice anything. Um, I have a really great picture of a hoof abscess we ruptured, or video of a hoof abscess we ruptured yesterday, if I can get it to play. This was a lot of fun. So that's all pus dripping out of there, out of that hole. Yay. This is what veterinarians live for. And we missed the first swipe of the hoof knife when it all came out at once. But anyway, that's like our favorite thing to do. All right, so moving on. Oops, I have to close that apparently. I closed it all. Oh, no. Sorry about that. Can you help me out here, Justin? I don't know. Where is it going? Oh, I have to take it off the projector? Got it. And then I have to go to Google Docs. It was still worth it to see that video. All right, so it's not that. It's the very obvious one with purple feet. Where is it? That's 
business. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm not technologically savvy at all. All right. Um, so laminitis, definitely the next most common thing we see. Uh, there are lots of potential causes of laminitis. By far the number one is obesity um, and insulin resistance. So it's all kind of tied together. Equine metabolic syndrome is uh, insulin resistance combined with other signs like regional fat deposits. Um, and being overweight. So um, this little mini up in the corner, definitely I would bet you money has <laughs> pretty strong insulin resistance. Um, he's got a huge crusty neck, that's one of the signs. And um, definitely I would categorize him as obese, probably give him a nine on the body condition score, which is a zero to nine, one to nine scale. Uh, so insulin resistance is the number one risk factor we see for laminitis. Um, it's actually, they don't completely understand the mechanisms, but um, having those high insulin levels in their bloodstream at all times uh, makes them prone to an inflammatory response. And when horses have an inflammatory response in their body, you see it in their feet. Uh, that lamina is very sensitive to inflammation and will start to separate. Uh, the second most common reason we see for laminitis is Cushing's disease or pituitary pars intermediate dysfunction, PPID. And 50% of the time, if they have one, they will have the other. So um, insulin resistance and PPID together. So then they've got a double whammy risk for laminitis. Um, so really, if I have an older horse that's foundering for the first time, I recommend testing them for Cushing's disease. Because um, definitely there is a treatment available for that. Um, Prescend, Pergolide works really well and might help prevent future laminitic episodes. So if that's something we can do, we definitely want to do it. Um, there are some other less common causes of laminitis, but if you have a really sick horse, um, such as a uterine infection um, because of a retained placenta or um, a really bad colitis or diarrhea case, um, or a severe pneumonia, anything that can make a horse very systemically ill can also cause laminitis. Basically, I learned in vet school, a horse's goal is to get laminitis or colic. <laughs> that seems to be their goal in life, both of which are very life-threatening. So uh, pretty much any of those illnesses in horses can lead to laminitis as well. Um, steroids, so this is why we are careful on our steroid dosages. If you have a horse with heaves or skin issues, the reason we can't just give them all of the dexamethasone in the world is because it has a side effect of a risk of laminitis. So um, luckily we don't see that very commonly, but it is known if you ask any vets around there, um, they will say that steroids can cause laminitis um, at inappropriate dosages. And then grain overload. So the reason we want you to call us if your horse gets into the feed room and eats half a bag of grain is laminitis. Um, that's one of the biggest risks that we worry about. They cannot handle that level of carbohydrate in their bloodstream, and per usual, it'll inflame the lamina and cause them to founder. So what is really going on inside the hoof? Um, actually, that picture up in the left-hand corner 
probably that horse's x-rays would look way worse than the ones um, over here. But I wanted to show you that picture so you could see what's called the divergent growth rings. This is one of the things that farriers will look at. And just by taking a glimpse of your horse, they can say, oh, he has chronic laminitis. Uh, this is what they're looking for. Those lines that are narrow in the front and wider in the back. So um, here is the Velcro attachment again. So you have the outer hoof wall, the inner hoof wall, and then the Velcro attachment of that of the lamellae in there. And then the other side is the bone, the coffin bone inside the foot. So it's it's attached together like this. And unfortunately, once it's pulled apart, unlike Velcro, it doesn't go back together. So in the lower right hand side here, this is a picture of normal healthy lamella and then lamella that have been damaged. And you can see why it's not so simple to just put them back together. So for this reason, rotation from laminitis is irreversible. Uh, so one of the things we're looking at when we take those x-rays is this rotation of the coffin bone here. Uh, we want it to be nice in line with the outer hoof wall. We don't want any separation. Uh, there are definitely different degrees, and once you get to the point that you have um, severe laminitis down here, the tip of that coffin bone is putting a lot of pressure on the sole, and that's extremely painful. And what you do risk, ultimately, that bone coming right through the bottom of the foot, and that's the point where we have to recommend euthanasia. So what can we do about it? Um, this is why you really need to get your farrier and your veterinarian involved. They have to use these x-rays to come up with a trimming plan to fix that rotation. So this is before the trim and this is after. But basically, they want this bone to come back in line. So this line here is just about flat with the ground. Does that make sense? So we cannot reverse rotation. We can't get that bone to float back up where it was. But what we can do is change the conformation of the hoof so that it's growing in the right direction again. So they're going to take some measurements based on our x-rays and, and make a few cuts to do that. But basically, they're going to cut off all this excess toe because that's just giving extra torque and putting pressure on that lamella like Dr. Latcher talked about, putting forces that you don't want. And then they're also going to take down the heel. That's that cut here. And this might not, very often, is not able to be accomplished in just one trim or shoeing cycle. You're going to have to do it over a period of time. But ultimately, that's the goal. And this is also somewhere where, in severe cases, if it can't be done just with trimming, we'll use shoes to accomplish this. There are a bunch of different ways to skin this cat. There's um, rocker shoes, like this one. So what that's doing is taking the breakover, or the point in the stride where the horse um, tips onto the front of the foot. It would have been here, but this shoe brought it back to here. So um, it, again, you're doing all this to get that nice straight line down from the fetlock, to have the weight centered, and to have it not growing out in front of the horse in the wrong direction. One thing that's nice about these clog options, again, you're bringing the brake over back from here to here, but it also lets the horse kind of move around and find where it's comfortable. So if the horse is comfortable standing up on its on its toes or you know kind of rocked back on its heels, it can do that. This is one with rubber on the bottom so it can kind of just move its foot all around. So on a really painful horse, this is what we'll go to to try to get them comfortable. All right, and then long-term management. So once your horse has been diagnosed with laminitis, we're gonna try our hardest to prevent an episode, an acute episode of laminitis from occurring again. And it is a lifetime thing, and you cannot reverse rotation from laminitis. So it's all about prevention. Um, so at this point, like I said, we've probably tested them for Cushing's disease. If they're positive, we're going to put them on percent. Um, we've tested their insulin levels, because that's a huge predisposing factor. If they need to lose weight, we might put them on Thyroel. Now, don't go home and say Dr. Ferguson said that horses are hypothyroid. That's not why we're putting them on Thyroel. We're putting them on Thyrell as kind of a metabolism booster. So we want them to lose weight faster. We're not treating hypothyroidism. That does not really exist in horses. Um, we're going to put them on a diet feed, a balancer pellet, almost zero calories. 
um, very, very low starch. Starch is what we worry about in these insulin-resistant horses. So the most common ones that we use are Purina Enrich or Neutrinas Empower Balance. Um, very, very low calorie, low starch feeds. Um, you're probably going to want to invest in a grazing muzzle. I love this brand. This is called Green Guard, but whichever type works for your horse is awesome. Um, that's to limit their grass intake. They can still eat through it. They can definitely still drink through it. Just cuts down how fast they can eat grass by about 30%. Uh, so, and then exercise. And people say, well, my horse is too sore to ride. Okay, well, time to get creative. Um, we have a client with four minis and she chases them around behind the golf cart um, every day. So there are ways to exercise your horse even if it's not ridden exercise. And um, we see huge differences even if you can get in about 15 to 20 minutes, four or five days a week, that will totally change their metabolism and get them going in the right direction and losing weight. And then if your horse is prone to recurrent limited episodes, you might want to invest in some soft ride boots, which are just what they sound like, but really cushy boots that you can just Velcro on, get your horse through the few days when it's most sore, maybe for five days or a week or so, and then take them off again. Um, it's also a nice thing to have on hand before your farrier can get out there to help keep your horse more comfortable. All right, white line disease. This is the next most common thing. And don't worry, laminitis is the biggie. <laughs> that one's really complicated, but it's hopefully I explain it in a way you guys can understand. Um, white line disease is when they get bacteria up in this layer between the hoof wall and the underlying lamina. It's also called CD toe. You might have heard of that expression. Um, it can occur in multiple limbs. It's not always just one. I've definitely seen it more than one foot at a time. Um, it's one of the many things that horses are prone to with the wet weather we have around here. Um, and it's a perfect environment for that moisture-loving bacteria to get up in those cracks. Uh, usually horses will have some underlying white line separation that makes the holes big enough for the bacteria to get up in. Uh, so luckily the treatment, the bacteria that likes to live in these cracks likes moisture and darkness and does not like air. So the best treatment is just exposing it to air and the bacteria will die. So that's why we do some radical debridement, you know, like we've done here and up in that corner, even a little higher, um, just so we can open it up to air. And usually that is enough to kill the bacteria and fix the problem. Um, is that yeah. No. Um, well, it depends on the underlying reason. So sometimes it is, but I'd say, I don't know, maybe like 40% of the time we have to go um, for another shoeing cycle and cut up a little bit farther. Um, but once you've gotten on top of the whole area, so like on this horse, the first debridement, we might open it up to here. But then if we come back and take x-rays six weeks later, um, that crack will have grown down, but we're going to have a little bit more to debride. We're going to have to debride that top part. But just because I can't take the whole hoof wall off at, at once, that's going to destabilize the hoof capsule a little bit. But once you've gotten to the top of that gas pocket, once it's grown down and you've been able to debride the foot off in front of it, you, you should be done. Yeah, now they can get another different infection later on the next time um, the horse stands in wet ground, but that infection will be treated. Um, so we like to kill the bacteria as fast as possible. So in addition to just exposing it to air, we usually uh, use some sort of drying agents. Um, the most aggressive and most effective one is probably clean tracks. Um, it's a powdered form and you soak the horse's foot in it. Um, it's important that you have a tall soaking bag. Um, you mix the powder with the water and then you, you seal the bag because those gas fumes that it creates get into the cracks and really kill that bacteria. Clean tracks is probably the most aggressive treatment for this. Not necessary in every case, but probably is like the gold standard of white light treatment. Um, then there's white lightning. Um, we have that as a gel form, um, but there are several forms of it. Um, again, you just apply that topically to kill that bacteria. Um, Caramend by Kinetic Vet also makes a white line paste. Um, if you're not able to treat it as often, you can just slather that paste in the, in the hole that we've cut out there and leave that for a couple days. 
so that no new bacteria can get in and hopefully it kills all the bacteria that was there. Um, and then other iodine-based um, drying agents, formalin-based like Duracell or Thrushbuster, um, will work as well if that's all you've got on hand. But this is another good example why you have to work with a farrier and a veterinarian because you know the farrier can do this, but they don't really know if they've gotten on top of it until we come out and take an x-ray and see how far up that gas pocket goes. All right, thrush. So thrush primarily affects the frog of the foot. I was told in vet school that horses will never be lame because of thrush. Well, that professor was wrong. <laughs> I have seen real bad lameness from thrush. Now, it has to be pretty bad thrush. It has to be thrush to the point that it's really stinky and probably has some great goo coming out of it when you stick a hoof pick in there. And it's pretty nasty, but it definitely can cause lameness. Um, so usually you find it deep in this central sulcus. That's the big groove that starts in the middle of the heel bulb and comes down the middle. Um, but you can also find them in the collateral sulci, the grooves along the side. I just saw one of those yesterday, here and here. And basically, this bacteria just eats away the frog until there is nothing left. Um, so you'll see a crumbled, recessed frog has a very characteristic odor if you've uh, had thrush before. Or if your horse has stinky feet, ask your vet next time we're out if we think that it might have thrush. Because um, that's probably, at least for us um, vets who have seen it over and over again, that's the number one sign. So per usual, you're going to learn here, it's kind of a theme. Moisture is the enemy of horse feet. So we want to keep this dry. So no wrapping, because wrapping is going to trap the horse's natural moisture in there. Um, so we want to leave the wraps off. And I recommend just cleaning with a dry hoof pick once a day and applying one of these treatments. Um, tomorrow and today, they're actually meant for um, mastitis in cows. They're intramammary infusions. Um, but luckily, that nice long tube lets you get deep in that groove um, to treat it. So you want to squirt these right up in there. You can buy these um, by the box at Tractor Supply. Um, it's the same ingredients. Tomorrow is slightly stronger than today. Um, but those are absolutely the best for treating thrush. Again, if you don't have any of that and you have some white lightning on hand, um, that will work for thrush as well. Um, Caramend by Kinetic made it's a thrush product that works great too, um, called Caramend Thrush Paste, very effective. And then good old Thrush Buster that you can buy at your local tax shop. Um, that's what I've always used in the past. If you have a mild case, that'll be fine. But if you're not getting on top of it, definitely come to us and get one of these stronger products. Okay, mushy foot. So, again, welcome to Florida, the sunshine state where we have hurricanes and swamps and rain all the time. Um, so this is another problem for horses just being on wet ground. It doesn't have to be standing water like in the picture. It can just be pastures, lush pastures with dew on the grass. But basically from standing in all that moisture, the sole of the foot just starts to crumble. I couldn't find as many pictures on this because this is kind of a disease we've made up. Mushy foot is not something I learned about in vet school, but it is definitely something that exists in Florida. Um, luckily, it's not usually very severe. It doesn't usually progress to anything um, very nefarious, but it is kind of a pain around here. Um, the soles will be just crumbly. They are peeling away. You touch them and layers just fall off. And soft enough that I don't even need to use my hoof testers. I can just put thumb pressure on them and see that sole bounce. Um, and the problem is these horses will be a little foot sore. So um, thin-soled horses, thoroughbreds are really prone to this. Uh, so there are kind of two schools of thought on treating uh, mushy foot. It's kind of like, you know, if you want to get calluses on your feet, I'm going to tell you to walk around barefoot in the summertime on the blacktop and you'll get calluses on your feet. Uh, so that's probably, that's the Duracell and do nothing else route. Okay, Duracell is going to harden up the sole, and then you're just going to let it go. You're going to keep it as dry as possible. You're not going to mess with it. The other option is if you say, okay, well, my horse has to go to a show this weekend and I can't have him sore, um, cast padding. You can have your farrier or vet come out and put cast padding to protect the sole. But that's going to be like wearing sandals outside on the blacktop in the summer. 
that sole underneath the cast padding is not going to harden up. Um, so you're temporarily fixing it because you're giving the horse a layer of protection, but you're not really hardening that mushy sole. Also, a lot of these horses, I mostly see this in barefoot horses, sometimes just putting a regular old shoe on will get the foot up off the ground enough that the mushy foot is no longer a problem. So trying a set of shoes for a cycle might solve your problem. Um, Durasol is a wonderful product. Um, it is meant to be applied on a clean and dry foot. Water will inactivate it. So don't do it like in a wet wash stall. And I usually, after you apply it, you want to put it all over the sole, this entire area. And then I usually hold the foot up for about a minute to let it start to dry and then put it down. Don't worry, we're oh, we're almost done. I got really excited doing this PowerPoint. So <laughs> this is the last slide. Um, so hoof cracks. Mostly owners worry about these and I don't. Um, if I saw the one in the upper right hand corner, I would say, nah, don't worry about that crack. It just needs a good trim. Um, just rounding the toes off. If I saw the one in the lower right there, I probably, I probably wouldn't even notch it. I'm sure that farrier did it for the owner just because the owner asked them to. But these little tiny cracks that don't go very deep, that are all down at the bottom, they really don't tend to cause a problem. Um, now, the bad cracks are these. The quarter cracks. So the side of the horse's foot there is called the quarter. There's some things I don't like about that crack. The location. I don't mind as much when they're when they're in the middle like there's over here, but these are on the quarters. That's bad. Um, the length, they go all the way up and they involve the coronet band, which is where the hoof has to grow out. So if we don't fix that, that crack is going to continue to grow out like that for the horse's entire life. And you can't see this, but we could see it on this horse's x-rays, but the depth. So as soon as you get through that thick hoof wall, that outer fingernail layer, you get into that sensitive lamina. So this owner had us come out there because the horse was lame, um, and it was lame right over those cracks. Um, this was, I believe, the right hind and left hind foot. Anyway, they were bilaterally symmetrical. So when you have one crack, look for another one. Horses tend to be pretty symmetrical um, in that way. So definitely look for more problems. And then basically all you can do is, in these bad cracks, you want to spare the weight bearing on that surface. So this is some fancy Eric Fox handiwork here, combined with some portrait mode photos. <laughs> but basically, he custom made this shoe so that this part of the hoof behind the crack is not bearing any weight. So that's going to take the torque off of that part of the crack and allow it to heal. This horse also had a white line on top of it, so I told you one problem tends to lead to another. So we treated it with clean tracks, and we opened up that track there to expose that white line to air. Um, the one other thing I would recommend for any hoof cracks is biotin. Um, now, you're, if you're on a good quality feed, it might already have biotin thrown in there. Um, but an excellent supplement you can get is Farrier's Formula, very high in biotin. Um, and that's just basically like a hoof hardener. Um, but it's definitely been proven to work. And if you know us, you know we're not big on supplements, but biotin is definitely one that's worth it. All right. And I think that's about it. Does anybody have any questions? The hoof crack. In this horse, I'm worried that it never will go away completely because it starts at the coronet band, and that's where the hoof is going to grow down from. But I was hoping that he would at least get more comfortable in one or two trimming cycles by just resting it. So we were we were thinking two shooting cycles. Yeah. Yes. You mentioned Farmingdale. Mm -hmm. oh. I have a mare that's a super easy eater. Mm -hmm. She's a free choice A and a rapid military, and that's it. And two of the past three years she's been off very mild arthritis. She late August, early September, probably due to daylight changes and cortisol. Okay. So should I be um, ahead of the game? Should, should I be supplementing that horse with thyroid health, like for the month of August and September? Totally depends on the horse's weight. Is she overweight? She tends to get overweight if I don't ride her. And our weather is such that I'm a little nervous about exercising her. Yeah. You know, yeah. That, you know, the past couple months. So thyroid L is 
basically a weight loss supplement. So if the horse is overweight, I'd say yes, it's worth supplementing. Sorry, the question was, um, if your horse tends to get laminitic episodes once a year in the fall around the same time, should you preemptively treat that horse with thyroid L? Um, so if the horse is overweight, then yes, it sounds like a good addition when you're already doing everything you can diet and exercise wise. Um, that's when we'll add in thyro L. And it's very safe to supplement. Um, the only place I wouldn't use it is some of these horses, especially with um, PPID and Cushing's disease, um, they are actually underweight. They're actually thin. Um, they're still foundering from the Cushing's disease and the high cortisol levels it causes. But um, they're over, being overweight is not their problem. So you have to really look at um, what problem you're treating and what the underlying cause of that laminitis is. But if it is obesity, insulin resistance, being overweight, then yes, thyroid sounds like a good addition. Yes. Real, real quick, I'm just going to. All right, so just so you guys know, I'm going to bring, because he's in front, I'm going to do Eric first. This is not an order of preference. Just kidding. <laughs> So, <laughs> we have three farriers here tonight in case you guys have any farrier specific questions when we're done but we've got eric we've got andrew come on come on come on come on come on thank you guys come on, come on. Totally calling best, sure. yeah and they each have their name so that you don't have to remember their names they're wearing them yep and then we have jim mcnall here um you if you can't remember his name you just have to go with mr mcnall yeah so there you go mr mcnall they all have their names on them so we've got all three of these guys here if you've got any farrier specific questions too. Okay. <laughs> and we aren't going to make them stand up here, but just so you know, you can stand up here if you want, but you don't have to. And I'll share the microphone with you. I'm good. Yeah. So. Okay, sorry, in the back. Well, there's a question for the doctors or farriers. Does it give you the on blood so like barrier barrier and care and things like that? So the question is about products. That's right. Mostly the topicals, right? Yeah. All right. So I have a life that I recommend. I like a Farrier's Formula or a Horseshoe Secret uh, Rainmaker. And it scares a lot of people because it is a conditioner. But they actually are oil-based and they repel the outside moisture while they maintain the natural moisture to the hoof. Um, I've had bad luck with Heratex. It's a high-dollar product. It over-dries out of foot. So where I come back and the foot is almost brittle sometimes when you go to touch it. But uh, anything that you can put on a horse's foot in this kind of climate and weather is going to help out immensely. Yeah, anything drying. Again, water is the enemy. See, I'm not a huge fan of sealers myself. You know what I mean? Like like I say, I, I like Rainmaker and it scares people because it is conditioner. You feel like you're adding moisture. But it, uh, go home and experiment. If you add Rainmaker or uh, Horseshoe or Secret to your horse's it's foot, paint water. the frog and paint the horn, set it down and spread it with water, those 10 minutes later, it's going to beat off like a brand new wax car. Mm -hmm. And that's what I like about the oil-based stuff versus the, the sealants that just don't allow any outside moisture to come in at all. And one of the biggest questions I always get asked, well, what should we give our horse? Okay, good feed, good hay, you know, and every, horses are like humans. You don't know what's the best thing they're going to get. You know, they've got all kinds of different stuff you can give their hooves. They've got everything under the sun, but you don't know. I mean, every, if you feed good hay and good feet, that's going to help your horse more than anything in the sun with everything, not just their feet, but, I mean, production-wise, they're, they're going to do the best. You can't, don't go out and buy the cheapest stuff in the world and think, oh, he's going to do fine, because that's not how it works. I mean, it's like you, I mean, whatever you do. Yeah, Did you have a follow-up question? question? Um, how about those turpentine products? Like the Venice turpentine? Is that what we're... They'll help the bottom of the foot if it's yeah. sore, but... It's kind of 1920s technology. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Thorough Soul a lot better. It's iodine, it sinks into the foot and hardens it from the inside out versus putting like a plastic shell, which is what Venice turpentine does. Don't get me wrong, Venice turpentine works, but it's a sticky, nasty, gooey kind of mess. We can do better. And basically. don't put it on before we get there because it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> Your bill's going to go up. We don't want it on the road. Just yeah, like official. Yeah. Everybody is that official. We're doing, that's fine, but not when we get there. <laughs> do you have a question? Yeah, I, I noticed and was happy to see a couple of shots showing using Duracell because I used that on my horse that had thin on soul. Yeah. But what is what is the, what is it How doing? does it work? Yeah, what is it doing for the horse? I mean, I read the stuff and it seems to... It actually...
actually binds to, I believe, the proteins in in the soul. Um, I looked it up recently. It, it's um, it makes polymers, so like strong matrices, with the natural um, ingredients of the hoof wall and and the soul. Like I said, it's it's like our fingernail, but it binds with that and strengthens it. Um, that's why you need to kind of let it dry on there to do its thing. Yeah. Um, and there are two different types. One has alcohol with it to help speed that drying process. Um, but yeah, it's actually binding to the inner matrix of the of the soul to strengthen it. Yes. What about copper socks or berry berry or all the copper sulfate products? Uh, yep, yeah, they're really good for I think treating thrush, and that was that's the main place I would use them. Um, to a lesser extent, white line disease too. Um, again, they're kind of just caustic agents that will um, kill bacteria, like your iodine-based products. The biggest thing there is open it up the air. Yeah. It's the mold behind the drywall, you know I mean? If you don't get it opened up and let the air get in there and dry it out, you're gonna keep fighting the battle, keep fighting the battle. Yeah, and I haven't had the greatest luck with copper talks over, like it turns me green. <laughs> <laughs> I had a bad I had a bad experience with it. I had a bomb oh, out in my old trailer and I looked at green, Copper talks for about three years. <laughs> we have PTSD from Copper talks, but I just I haven't had the same luck with Copper talks as I have with like the Dursol or like the Ricketts product that uh, Jim McNall really likes. Yeah. Um, yeah, that stuff Jim, is good it's, too. Uh, it's called Jim Ricketts foot formula. It's an I'm not to add that in, but I can add the name. Um, product and it works really well to dry and harden the bottom of the foot. Uh, it also kills the bacteria and thrush and white uh, white line disease as well. You can get it at TT Distributors and Farriers Depot. And that is uh, Rickens, Jim, 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 uh, Jim Rickens, Rickens Foot Formula. Jim Rickens Foot Formula. That doesn't sound like snake oil at all, but it really isn't. <laughs> 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 Don't worry about it. Jim Rickens Whatever Foot it is, Formula. It <laughs> and it's, it's very similar to the Durasol product. Both of those are, are pretty similar products. I will say that the Rickens smells a little better. Mm -hmm. um, a little more aromatic. You don't um, need to cover your purple. No, yeah, things get brown. You get brown. Yeah. What color do you want to be? Right? <laughs> the first fact, could I recognize the difference between an abscess and laminitis? Ooh. <laughs> okay. yeah, between yeah, abscess yeah, and laminitis. Sometimes no. <laughs> abscess is most often in one foot at a time. Laminitis is most often in both front feet. Not that there's anything different anatomically with the hind feet, but horses carry 70% of the weight on their front feet because their head and neck weigh so much. So that's usually why you see um, that stance where they're shifting their weight back onto the hind feet, because usually laminitis affects both front feet symmetrically at the same time. This is where I kind of have my own version of it, is uh, an abscess to me looks like a broken leg. When you show up and your horse is on weight bearing on that foot, often can't put the weight down. Uh, that screams abscess to me, you know what I mean? Whereas you come out and you see something that's laminetic or pre laminetic, they want to walk back on their heels. Usually their feet are out in front of them and they're leaning back with their weight on their end. Unless you have like a sinker or something, which is a really Well, for the past case. week, we've done double, we've we've had a lot of, I want to be laminetic and get an abscess. Right. So, so they're often both at the same time. Any kind of hope distortion like with the laminitis, uh, an abscess is going to come, it's going to happen. So, yeah. I mean, they it'll blow out, hand it'll hand blow hand out somewhere at one point. Yeah, yeah, they walk hand in hand, but I mean, I get called out all the time to someone that thinks their horse might be laminetic, and, and luckily enough, you pop an abscess and walk away. To me, an abscess is a great fix because it's quick, it's easy. You can pause. Instant pus. release. Oh. <laughs> Instant release. Yep. Yeah. 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 And did you have a question? Yeah, how would you know what this was? Um, you can really see that. Um, you lift up the foot and look at that line between the outer hoof wall and the sole, and there's visible separation there in those horses with like white line. Um, a lot of times they look like this top picture, like the foot yeah. is really starting to pull away from the hoof, or the hoof's about four is starting to pull away from the hoof. So uh, it, it would be real chalky. When that pulls away, you'll get dirt and crud stuck in there that will hold moisture in there, and that's what will breed the uh, fungal infection. I do want to bet that crack that you see up in the top right or top left corner there. Yeah, I bet there's white line disease that goes yeah. up and sure. You're and probably right. Halfway up, I bet it's full of white line disease. <laughs> <laughs> I bet it's full of white line disease because yeah. of the fact that every time that there's an opening in the hoof wall, it's just an entryway for that bacteria and the fungus to just jam its way up in there. And as soon as it's cut off from oxygen, it just thrives. And we go back to leverage. I mean, if they got an open in there and they put pressure on their toes, that leverage is coming up and it's putting torque on the higher 
parts of their laminized that is the reason that they go lame from it. I really like clean tracks. I mean, it takes a little bit of time. You soak up your foot in clean tracks and open it up like this, and then just manage it growing down. Uh, most of the time, you'll see it. Keep it opened up. Keep oh my God, that looks horrible. Keep it open up for a little while. Then. But we are all going to be here to answer all your questions. They're still here with the blood mobile. Yeah. I tried very hard, but I couldn't donate. We, we tested three times, just to be sure. So, somebody has to go donate in my place. So, off you go. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys.